This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Most of these talks are about entrepreneurship, and we have successful entrepreneurs come in to talk to you. Tonight we're going to talk about intrapreneurship, which involves a lot of the same qualities and skills, just on a larger scale. So before this talk, how many of you have heard, had heard of applied materials? So maybe a quarter of the room. How many of you are engineers? So most of you who have heard of applied materials are engineers. Um, one of um, Applied Materials is one of Silicon Valley's elite companies, uh, and they've been in business for 45 years. Uh, they last year had 8.7 billion dollars in revenue. Uh, they are one of the the best IP generators in Silicon Valley. They spent 1.2 billion dollars on R and D last year alone, and they produce a patent every day on average. So engineers, who can tell me what Moore's Law is? So, yes, sir. Right. Right. So every 18 months, the number of transistors you can put on a circuit board doubles. For those of you without engineering degrees, what that means is every 18 months, you have to be twice as good as you were before. And that's an incredible rate of change. 45 years Applied Materials has been in business. Uh, for 45 years, Applied Materials makes the equipment that makes computer chips. So they have to be ready for Moore's Law before all the chip, the, the, the chip manufacturers do. So it's an incredible rate of change. It requires an incredible amount of innovation. Uh, we're talking about a big company that's multinational and they constantly have to reinvent themselves. And that's what tonight's speaker is going to talk to you about, Nir Mary. Uh, Nir is the vice president of the Synexus Engineering Division of Applied Materials. Uh, that's the division that produces the tools that all the other divisions use uh, to keep up with Moore's Law. Uh, they're responsible for semiconductors, but also flat panel displays and uh, also the energy sector. Uh, what's really interesting about Nir is his personal background. Uh, he has a son at UCSB right now, but Nir's dad also went to UCSB and got his PhD here. Uh, Nears the black sheep of the family. He has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree uh, from Berkeley. So Nir, we're, we're going to start a, a master's degree in technology management. So uh, we're welcome to have you come back. You can go to school with Alon and go to parties at Isla Vista together. And I'm sure that'll work out really well. <laughs> so without further ado, Nir, Nir Mary. And to complete the story, actually my wife is a UCSB graduate, so it's full complete. My son, my wife, and my dad. But um, I'll spend next hour talking a little bit about innovation and innovation leadership, specifically from Silicon Valley perspective or nano manufacturing, which is what we do. Uh, I'll start with just a simple story. This is, my, this is myself. I was about 13 year old, grew up in Israel. That was just before my bar mitzvah. 
And my rich uncle got me this transistor radio, made by Philips, had five transistors in it. I was so proud. That was the state of the art of mobile music of the time. Okay? Uh, this is my son, my youngest son, not the one going to UCSB. Much cooler, much better looking than me. And for his bar mitzvah, we got him an iPod. His uncle didn't buy it, I had to buy it. And let's see what happened in 37 years, okay? Uh, the transistors that went in the device on the left were about 12 cents a piece. The transistor went to the, the device on the right, 10 to negative 9 cents per piece. Just to give you a sense that if we didn't scale it properly, <laughs> that device would be the size of a house and cost about a billion dollars, okay? If we just didn't scale it. So you have a sense that to do that, we need to do something very rapidly, which we call innovation. And we'll define later innovation, what it's about, what it's not about. But fundamentally, it's creating value to someone. And we'll show you how we do that on a daily basis. But I'll tell you a story, start with myself, or where it came from. What's the path that led me to actually Santa Barbara, first place I landed um, in the US with Isla Vista. Be surprised, because my dad was doing a PhD. And I end up in the Bay Area and leading the innovation at Silicon Valley Company. So let's start with geography, okay? Anyone recognize that? That's Europe, North America, Middle East. Uh, oh, you have, you have some uh, geographically challenged folks here. So U.S. is on the left, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Uh, but Israel, can anyone see it? Here, I'll show you. You can see it? Oh, I'm sorry, it disappeared. Here it is. Uh, that little sliver is Israel, tiny little country. A lot of innovation, and that's what a privilege you're growing up. And grew up on a beach, a place like Ala Vista, about 400 yards from the beach. And uh, I'll show you some little stories about it. It's a called kibbutz. Anyone heard about a kibbutz? Okay, it's a little co community. As you can see here, just look like Ala Vista. Nice beach, huh? It actually has f islands you can swim to. So I grew up there. And the kibbutz is a full community. It has schools, it has industry, it has even a banana plantation, a fish pond, and that's where I had a chance to grow up. Actually, from early age, I loved swimming, and that's ended up giving me my first profession, which was underwater demolition. Okay, so that have, kibbutz has a beautiful diving area, and even a great place to do underwater archaeology. So age 15, I end up signing for the Underwater Archaeology Society. And that's just across the beach, we found an old Phoenician chi ship. Uh, actually, we dove there, and there was a ship that was 2,000 year old, okay? Merchant ship that traveled along the Mediterranean coast. And we excavated, and it's actually, it's in university right now in Haifa. You can uh, go and see the pieces and artifacts we dug from underground. But that's where I kind of developed the passion for the sea. A kibbutz, the one I grew up, was actually formed by a bunch of 18-year-olds, like you're, you were about a year or two ago, uh, that finished high school and said, what are we going to do? We're going to create a community called the kibbutz. Okay? Uh, they were drafted by the state of Israel to create actually a factory underground to make bullets. That was their first profession. My dad's first profession was making bullets under the ground, hidden from the Brits, so they can make a support the creation of Israel. Uh, then they settled and created a community which is very, very affluent right now. They have about over $200 million worth of income annually and over 2,000 people live there. Some pictures so you can see how it looks. It's quite nice. And actually just next to the kibbutz, within 100 yards, there's the old Roman ruins because Israel's you know, been invaded by every country in the world for the last few hundred thousand years. So the Romans settled there and this is actually um, mill that used to turn grain into flour and they, by damming the local river, which is called Crocodile River, because they used to have crocodile until a few hundred years ago. Okay? So this just within, and it's known for its beautiful uh, wildlife, birds specifically. People come from all the world to see the flamingos, the storks, uh, even swans every few years. Okay? So here's some picture. So this is where I, had to, I grew up. Certain point, I grew up like you guys. I did not have the privilege of being able to go to UC at that point. I had to go to military service where I volunteered to go become a commando. 
And it's quite related to the, spa uh, the topic of innovation, because to be a commander, you, we have to be very innovative, and I'll talk about the relationship between acting in a small team, being a big head, trying to solve problems, not planning for them, but acting and learning to react properly to them. So I naturally, I went to serve in the commandos. Uh, that was a very intensive four years. Okay, just sh show you some picture. You can see uh, type of boats we used to have, uh, and I was a diver, so most of the time I spent with bombs on my back and equipment hooked to my mouth and swimming. That's pretty much what I spent four years of my life. Or sometime we were in submarines, and these kind of submarines we we used all the time to travel underwater <laughs> rapidly to our destination. So that's actually a picture of myself there standing in one of our little subs. Okay, so this is give you a sense of where we are. So, four years finished. Where there's a beach, beach kind of similar to where I grew up. You see the similarities there? <laughs> huh? So one side is kibbutz, the other side is Ala Vista. So sure enough, I made that trip. Okay, I find myself here, and um, by the way, this is very similar to where my son is right now. If you look at him, that's what he did for class. I did it, 19 year old, same thing, but before a Navy dive. So, fi <coughs> finished very quick, intensive English class, went to two years at uh, Santa Barbara City College, and went to Berkeley to do my bachelor and master in robotics. It seemed like an interesting place, and Berkeley was known for the robotics capability, and that's the reason I chose it. After Berkeley, I ended up looking for a job. So here, we joined Ala Vista, we went to Santa Barbara City College, Berkeley, now what's next, job. And I'll talk a little bit about my school <coughs> experience, because I know you guys are now in the stage of your uh, academia, you're looking for a job, talk a little bit about my career, give you an idea about evolution. It's not always linear. Something you have to go backwards and move forward. So I started simply working with my professor on in, in innovation for medical field. And my first patent actually is surgical equipment to treat liver cancer and prostate cancer. And that was my first invention, okay? Uh, after spending a few months there, and finally patented, we sold it to a company and went public, went ahead and joined a small startup. I, I was asked earlier today, I have a choice going to a big company or a startup. I'm a college student, where should I choose? I said, you're young enough to take risk. So I felt that way too. So at that age, I went to join a company, I was employee number 14. Okay, that's a startup. And actually when I left, there were about 70. Okay, and I started as an engineer and ended up, because it was a startup, I had a chance to grow in the company very quickly. And within a few years, I became a manager, and a manager of engineer programs. I managed software engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, and then joined where Applied Material, where I'm right now. And I'm joining as an engineer. So even though I was a manager, felt very good, I'm a manager for people, I started Applied Material as an engineer, rank and file, doing the design, <coughs> okay? So my point is, somebody have to move backwards and move forward. I applied a chance to work, made years, and currently I'm the Vice President of Engineering. I have a global organization, okay? Uh, I have engineers sitting in India, in Montana, in Europe, in Austin, Texas, in Boston, and of course in Silicon Valley. And you can see the arc of my inventions also was that. So in terms of my journey, it's also over 40 patents, started with medical, going to home automation, which is energy line was home automation. And actually if one day you're gonna have a home with thermostat in every room probably borrows from my patent. Because that actually we designed a HVAC system or air conditioning system that controls the temperature in every room. Then I joined Applied and have most of my patents there. I just give an example, two patents in very different areas. The patents on the top actually is about how to increase your density of your hard disk maybe by a factor of 10. If we can pattern the hard disk one day, we can actually increase the storage of the data in to hard disk. The other one's in the rank of, rank of file robotics kind of uh, uh, patents, and most of my patents are in the robotics field. <coughs> As you can see, even though I study <laughs> mostly robotics and controls, my patents are all over the place, but that's also represent my career. 
So we talked a little bit till now about where it came from and how we got there, but now we're ready to talk about innovation. Okay, remember the slide early on? And with that, let's define innovation, because I think this is very important. I was asked earlier, how do you choose what to do? I started with value. This is a great definition by Carl Ulrich from Wharton. It really says it's the value creation, creating value for someone and delivering to the customer as innovation. So when we choose what to do, what to innovate, <coughs> we need to make sure it's create value for, to someone. The other definition which I like as much, or even something more, is a definition by the leader at 3M, Nicholson. It really said that the innovation is transformation of money into knowledge, and knowledge into more money. Why is it so interesting a uh, definition? It's quite very different than the first one. It described that at a certain point you take money, you do some experiments, you learn. Without learning, you can create a product that creates value to someone. And when we'll talk about innovation, we'll talk about the learning culture. The learning culture is all predicated on exactly that. Effective transformation of money into knowledge, and knowledge into more money in a very rapid cycle. Moore's law does not wait for us. It moves on. Okay? As a company, we're focused on any manufacturing. It's a term that this differently designed, simply defined small in the manufacturing, nano manufacturing, manufacturing things that are extremely small. The transistor inside your cell phone are very, very small. And that's nano manufacturing. In terms of, of the effects on yourself, I uh, almost see me everywhere with my iPad. <laughs> Tell me I, I even go to sleep with it sometime, my wife complains. Uh, <laughs> so if you, let's look inside this iPad. Because if you look inside of it, you see nano manufacturing everywhere. And all these pieces of equipment, uh, pieces of technology, are really made inside machines from applied materials. Okay, let's start from the upper left. You see that touch screen display? That touch screen display is actually glass. It has many layers of transparent conductor to sense where your finger is when you slide it across the screen. That's made inside applied <coughs> materials equipment. You see the LCD screen that display the beautiful pictures or the FaceTime, the videos there. That's made inside a applied material machine. You see the microphone or the image sensor or even the motion sensor to detect orientation of your device. That's made inside a applied material machine. The LEDs we used to make, now we don't make it right now in our equipment, but all the silicon, doesn't matter if the microprocessor or the baseband to communicate with the radio, or the memory, the storage, or NAND flash to store the data inside your device, all made inside a material machine. <coughs> so you can see here, the device you use on a daily basis is really benefiting for our technology around the clock. Okay? Uh, to that effect, uh, Thomas Friedman, I love this quote, because I'm gonna, not gonna give you an excuse. After gonna leave, you can say, I'm not one of these guys who don't know. I'm the one of the guys who know. So you know what's applying right now, right? It's the most <coughs> important US company that you probably never heard about, and now you've heard about us, OK? So let's talk about, uh, about the ecosystem. And I took here the number from 2010, 11, 12, very similar. But let's look at the world spending on electronics, because you see where we fit as a company. But $1.4 trillion is spent annually on electronics. But 3% of world GDP, OK? To that effect, they need to consume about $300 billion worth of semiconductor of chips, OK? To support that, companies are investing in factories, and we support the machines. We make the machines go in these factories. So you can see it's like a food chain. If we guys consume more phones, they buy more machines. If you switch your laptop tomorrow from a hard disk to solid state drive, it increases the consumption of chips versus hard disks. More companies are going to build factories with NAND flash. I have to sell more machine, or they're going to generate the next generation of NAND flash to actually higher density. Again, new set of machines. So give us a sense of the food chains that we live in. Okay, so we're highly dependent on you and your consumption. We started as a 
company that was semiconductor, but we expanded into display. That was the first transition out of semiconductor. So if you buy right now any LCD or even uh, OLED screen, it's made inside our equipment. And somewhere in the mid 2000s, we has actually expanded into solar. Okay. So, and I think the trends are good. More people are going to talk on the phone. More people want, you know, better energy that does not pollute, and the trends are in, in our favor. I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation in each one of our market because this really dictates why we innovate in the way we do. So, this all setting the stage for why we innovate the way we do. Anyone can tell me what this is? What's this graph? Come on. Anyone? Is that the cost of every circuit you make? Nope. Next. Anyone? This is actually Moore's Law. That's the way it was published in 1965 where Gordon Moore who was uh, from Intel. Okay? And as you can see, it simply states that there's a certain trend for innovation or the doubling of transistor on every chip every 18 to 20 months. Okay? So that was published. And by the way, this looks this way in real life. Each green dot represents the size of the transistor inside the chip. So if you look at the device you have in your hand, there are chips inside, there are transistor inside, and the size of the transistor is shrinking every two years. And every green dot represents one size of transistor. Notice that trend. The, by the way, this is a logarithmic scale. That is continuing. This is really dictates the cadence of our innovation at Applied Material. That means that every 18 to two, 18 months to two years, we have to come with a whole new set of equipment. So our customer, being Intel, Samsung, Toshiba, can actually develop the devices they committed to their customers. Okay. Uh, one more thing to notice. You see that yellow line there? That yellow line actually represents the wavelength of the light we use to write the patterns on the chip. You notice at a certain point the size of the chip became smaller than the light we write it with. That seems impossible, doesn't it? I'm going to give you a one millimeter tip on your pencil and tell you to draw a quarter of a millimeter line width on the paper. But that's exactly what we're doing. And we're doing it by actually drawing two lines quarter millimeter apart, or double patterning. So actually, you can see that even the light length that we used to write it was not a limit for our innovation. Okay? When we look at our product we have to develop, we really listen to our customer. They have the roadmap of technologies they have to develop. This is actually a cross section of a semiconductor chip. Okay? And for each one of them, think of it as a construction site. You start with foundation where the transistor is, and you build it up until you have a full chip, functional chip that you can put in your device. We look at a construction site, and every part of the operation requires a different machine. And every generation will require us to upgrade our machine or develop new solutions for these machines. That makes sense? So as you can see, this is a very complex device. And it shrinks every two years, almost in half. So if you look at this, the machines are very complex just as much. This is one of our machines, for example. People refer to it like a physics experiment on steroids. You know, you look at it, they say, boy, this is so complex. But that's what it takes to make a machine to process semiconductor chips. Uh, I'll show you one of the machines, for example, we developed. And I'll actually, I'll, while it runs, I'll explain that. We had a process. We always were the winner. We were making heating up a wafer at about 300 degrees per second, the customer were very happy. That's called anneal. And then they said to us, you know what, you heated about 300 degrees per second, what about a million degrees per second? From 300 to a million. So we had to find a new solution. This example, this is a laser anneal. So it actually heats up the wafer at a million degrees per second. Think of anything at home, you heat your milk. How quickly does it heat? So this heats the silicon wafer to real temperature at a million degrees per second. That requires different thinking. And we had to come with it quite rapidly and solve the problem. And you can see here it's running back and forth over the wafer 
annealing it, rapidly heating it for about 1100 degrees, and rapidly cooling it to create the right effect. It actually dictates the speed of the transistor. Okay? Flat panel display was the same kind of story. Who wants a bigger TV? Who wants a higher resolution TV? Who wants a 3D TV? You know, that trend is forcing us to come all the time with new sets of equipment. These are examples, three generation worth of flat panel display manufacturing equipment. You can see also the piece of equipment down here. And you can see that person standing in front of this equipment. You notice how small he is compared to that machine up there. Okay? This is what we're seeing. We had to actually increase the size so you guys can buy, go to Costco and buy for less than $2,000 a 60 inch TV. Now, that also enables one more thing. It allows you to buy bigger and cheaper. If you look at this blue line here, this is actually the cost per square meter of LCD screen over the years. You see that goes down in a logarithmic way? This is just as much as what we talked about the silicon earlier, right? We have a very sharp trend, and we can do it only through innovation. Any? So I summarize to you, I'm, I'm just gonna skip this sor solar story, but this is gonna, the summary slide of what we've been innovating for the last so many years. You can see on the top side is silicon. You can see the size of the transistor been going down and down. You can see the size of flat panel display. This glass is getting bigger and bigger. Or solar, if you see the bottom line, this is a cost per watt of solar cell. And you can see that in the 70s it was $90. Anyone want to guess where it's this year? 75. 75, yeah. Less than a dollar a watt. You know too many things in your life that are advancing so quickly? They're probably not too many, and that's what we do. So with this, we can now talk about innovation. We set the stage what we do, why we do it. Let's talk a little bit about innovation. And this is kind of my framework. I use it in Apply, I use it everywhere to describe what are the elements that affect our successful innovation. It's kind of this very busy slide. In the presentation, I'm really gonna cover very small pieces of it. We don't have three days. We're gonna cover only what we can cover in one hour. We're gonna start with strategy we use for innovation. Okay? We have to innovate. That's our lifeblood of success. How we set a strategy, where to focus, what to do. And we're going to talk about that. Today we talk about people and organization. This is a very important topic because innovation is created inside an organization called a company. And you create the right culture, the right priorities, the right kind of characteristic of interaction that produce the innovation. I'm going to skip the process of process and tools because we have a lot of uh, unique tools that allow us to collaborate globally and innovate very rapidly. And lastly, the focus is going to be on innovation leadership or the vision. Okay? With that, so let's start with the bottom innovation strategy. Let's define some world big space. All the things we can do at Applied Materials tomorrow morning. All the there is, draw on the bottom scale, all the technology we have in our company and the one outside our company. Let's draw on the other axis, all the markets we can serve, the one we're already serving and the one that are existing or don't exist yet. If we innovate, what should we call Horizon One? Within the technology we already have in a company, okay, and we're serving the market we're already serving, it's Horizon One. Is that complicated to invent Innovate Horizon 1? Not so much, right? I make a bike, I can make a better bike. I make a TV, I can make a slightly better TV. But then, there's an Horizon 2. What if I go to a new market that I'm not familiar with? Okay, Applied was big in semiconductor, let's go to solar. That's much more complicated. I don't know anything about solar. It's a new set of customer, new set of technologies, so that's Horizon 2. That was not te new technology for the world. It was not new market to the world. But when you go into Horizon 2, it's new to you. In Horizon 3 is really when you go and invent a market or invent a technology. That's hard. Okay? 
So when you set a strategy where to invent and where to innovate, <coughs> you put all your eggs in one basket? No. What do you think? No. Do you put all of them in Horizon 3 for long shots? No. So you try to balance. And we try to balance in a such a way that we always have some elements in Horizon 3 in our portfolio. And we have Horizon 2, and we have Horizon 1. So we create a balancing act. The Horizon 1 are necessary. Are your customer pro expect improvement every year. You, ex you expect it from your product you see around you. Our customer expect just as much. Horizon 2 is when we go to areas we are not familiar with, OK? We don't know so much about OLED, but we had to learn, because people are buying OLED screens, OK? In Horizon 3, we're going to go into a complete new field. I think there's a lot of opportunities we're going to be looking at, and we're looking right now. We're public about it. We get grants for them. For example, I believe battery, battery technology can go way far from where it is right now. And we can use technology to advance that. So there's many areas we can still use nano manufacturing to advance and benefit society. Notice this last thing I showed you. Horizon 1 does not require a lot of learning. Horizon 2, Horizon 3 require learning. It's very, very important. Horizon 1, you just make something better that you already know. To do Horizon 2 or 3 require to you to be effective in learning. So if you hear from me again and again, learning organization, ability to learn rapidly, this is what this is all about. To do Horizon 2 and 3, we need to be very effective learning. Now, we need to innovate where a customer cares about. For that, we need to list our customers and also to a customer's customers. That's you. So let's do a quick survey, right? Who has a cell phone here, smartphone? Everyone. When we need to choose what to innovate, how do we choose what to do? We ask our customer and our customer customer. Who wants a faster phone for gaming? That's mean a faster transistor. Who wants more sensitive touchscreen? That means next generation of touchscreen. Who wants a longer lasting battery? That means either a better battery or a device that consumes less electricity. So we really need to be conscious where you taking your product and where our customer and our customer customer need to take their product to develop the machines that address these markets. The example of two machines that exactly do that. The one on the bottom is for next generation touchscreen. The one on the top, for better dielectric that leaks less. The transistor actually lasts longer, leaks less. Another survey, that's television. I'll tell you something you don't know yet. Who wants UHD? Two people raised their hands, so nobody knows what it is. I want you to want H UHD. Right? So UHD is ultra high definition TV. Okay? If you went last to uh, CES in Las Vegas, most of the leading companies were selling and demonstrating ultra high definition. Okay? If your TV right now is 1080p, this one is going to be 2,000 or 4,000 lines TV. It's going to be like your retina display on your screen. You want it? <laughs> Anyone wants that now? Who wants UHD? <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Now, to make UHD requires a whole new set of equipment. So we're working on it to make it cost effective. You can buy now UHD, probably going to cost you ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Who has $20,000 to spend on TV? <laughs> Sorry, I don't have it too. Um, so to do that, to enable you to buy UHD, in a few years, we need to develop a whole new set of, of solutions. And by the way, it's very complicated, because when you go to this kind of TV, the transistors start hiding the light. So I need the transistor to be smaller to draw more current, so it can be, keep the brightness. And probably you want it in 3D, right? So you need faster processor, faster graphic processor. And probably you want a brighter screen, so you need quicker refresh rate, because you want 3D. All that require a whole new set of equipments that we'll have to deliver. So you understand, from your need, we need to translate it to equipment that we need to innovate, deliver to our customer, need to be robust, 
and deliver to them the product they want to sell you. Now we talk about the organization that can do what we just described, innovate so rapidly. Hmm. With that, actually going to start with a, my father, who was a PhD student here. And I'll use his story and his perception of organization to tell the story of what kind of organization is effective in innovating. Okay? And notice there are four books there with the years that they were published on top, 1976, 86, the other one in 86 actually published about a year later, and 95. And the arc of these four books tell you the arc of the perception of organization, what will make effective organization that can innovate and renew. The first book, 1975, even look at the graphics there, you see all these arrows starting first of all pointing in all direction and then eventually pointing straight up? That was a textbook for management that my dad published, okay? It was very, very um, innovative for its time, but look what it, ta it tells you. Organize everything in a straight line. Align everything. Everything should be controlled. And a lot of it about controlling and resolving conflicts between elements of the organization. It was not so much about, hey, how we can create chaos here to innovate. Okay? So then, when he wrote a thesis here at UC Santa Barbara, he wrote about the neurotic behavior organization. He actually noticed that some organizations, guess what? That are like neurotic people. They blame the environment for not being successful. Okay? They don't digest information very effectively. They don't react proportional to the stimuli and are not seems to be effective over time. Okay? Even suggested the type of therapies will work for these kind of organization. And that's, you see it all around. Do you think, for example, Xerox react, no, excuse me, Kodak reacted properly when the digital photography was invented? Even though they had many of the patents, they are not a major player right now in digital photography. Okay? So our ability to properly react to the environment, okay, and work in a current, sensible way is critical for our success. Then he noticed that some companies self-transform. That, that book was called Innovation Transform, excuse me, Organizational Transformation. And that was talking about our companies or organizations that self-transform. And I'll give you a few examples later. But I want to focus mostly on the last one, which is coping with uncertainty. This is really where the learning is. Then he recognized that it's all about the company ability to deal with uncertainties of the environment, to innovate, to self-transform, to reinvent itself. So the last book, Coping with Uncertainty, is really about reinventing, reinventing the company. You know? really talking about the company needs to be somewhere in a place between order and chaos. Does that make sense? I'm an executive in a company, I'm telling you, I need some chaos in my organization <coughs> to be inventive. And I tell, send that message every day to my staff. If everything you do is what I tell you, and everything is perfectly orderly, tops down, we'll fail. I need every one of the employees on my team to reinvent the company reinvent what they do, reinvent the solutions all the time, and that cannot happen tops down. So there's a certain balance between common vision, which is the order, and the chaos, which is, means you're not going to control everything you can do. Now let's be more specific in terms of the prescription in that book for effective innovation, because I can tell you this is the way we're running effective Silicon Valley companies. This is it. We need to balance in the e on the edge of chaos, or EOC, to perfectly order, common vision to chaos. We need to be very, very creative and effective learning. You heard, remember earlier, Horizon 2, Horizon 3 require learning. Organization that needs to survive over time need to be effective learning organization. Learn from a mistake, learn new things. For example, I'll give you an example later that for Apple to become a phone company, that makes your phone, they had to learn about many things they didn't know about before. Baseband, batteries, you know, touch screen for LCDs for, for phones. So there's learning aspect that's very critical. Next, next, we need to really encourage variety. 
and this is something you see Silicon Valley is that if you look at my team, it's most diverse people, different background, different education level, different back, different uh, interests, and that is critical to get the variety of ideas to succeed, manage uh, chaos, not avoid it, and lastly, evolve. Companies frozen in time will fail. It's a certainty. Okay, I'll give you an example. This is actually I went to the internet, to YouTube, captured there Steve Jobs standing in front of the screen, and the moment he eliminated the word computer from Apple computer. Apple was Apple computer. He deleted the computer called Apple. He had to reinvent a company. He turned it into a phone company, a gaming company, a, your music sourcing company, maybe your future textbook company. He basically reinvented the company and he needed to transform it, okay? And actually sometimes you think they've not achieved that transformation as well. If you remember the first iPhone had a problem with the battery, okay? Excuse me, with the antenna. <coughs> you, you held it the wrong way, it didn't communicate. So the ability to learn rapidly is critical to success. We've been doing it at Applied for year after year. Each one of these examples is basically whole new technology we had to introduce to our marketplace to be successful in, in keeping with Moore's Law. Okay, if we just stu stuck there and stuck with existing technology, we would have failed. Okay, last and very, very important topic, which is leadership. And you can have the best people, but if you don't lead them right, if you don't attract the right people, we're gonna fail as an innovating company. And I'm really gonna draw a lot of my experience as a Navy SEAL, and I'm gonna draw on a great movie. Anyone know what movie it is? Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, great. Well, I'm showing you Beetlejuice, because I'm gonna talk about something called Big Head and Little Head. Okay, you see a big head and a little head. Because the type of people we try to attract to do innovation is what we call big heads. And I'll try to define for you what big head and little head is. Okay, big head, hoshkodon, little head, hoshkotan. It's come from Hebrew, but it's true just here. So big head, minds everyone's business, annoying. What are you doing? Can I help you? Okay, little head, minds only their own business. Big Ed wants to know why you ask him to do what he is asked to do. Little Head, just tell me what to do, I don't care. Okay? Big Ed, question Arky, you're my boss, doesn't mean you know better. My daughter is Big Ed. Um, <coughs> um, Little Head, accept Arky, you're my boss, I'll do what you tell me. Doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. Okay? Big Ed, proactive, anticipate failures. All the time you're asked to do something that might fail, they anticipate that. They don't wait for them to fall, go over the ledge, and they say, oh, I maybe you should try something else. They anticipate failures. They question conventional wisdom, right? You cannot, if you always accept conventional wisdom, you will not try new things. Everyone said it's impossible, right? They don't accept that. They question boundaries versus accepting boundaries, which is a little head. You notice the contrast with these two personalities? When we interview, when we look for the innovators for our company, we do look for the big heads. We look for people who question conventional wisdom. We look for people that think as a system, not only look at the parts, to understand that everything succeeds as a system. They're not afraid of complexity, they actually like complexity, they're not trying to escape that. Okay? They're willing to take risks. They're not avoiding risk and they know that sometimes they're gonna fail, but they accept that. So you notice these two personalities. Now, the personality on the left, God, if you're a manager, young manager, you want the guys on the left. They're easy to manage, they listen to what you say, you're the smart, hey boss, you're right, you're the boss. I don't want these people if I want to innovate, okay? The guys on the right are hard to manage. They want explanation, why you ask me to do this? I need to get context for what I'm asked to do but are innovative. I'm drawing this purposely a contrast. And when we try to staff our team, try to write the environment, we want to create an environment that attracts these big heads. They don't feel stifled. I was, remember earlier I talked 
uh, with a couple of group here, and someone said, you know, I work with a big company here, and I feel really stifled. They didn't appreciate new ideas. And I said, that's not all big companies. Apply would not have survived if we would not welcome new ideas from young, innovative people on the day in and day out. Okay? So innovative leaders are really comfortable and are passionate about attracting big heads, and they know to manage them, keep them excited. Now let's, let's draw my team, okay? Anyone remember grassroots team distribution? Here's my team, okay? I drew them on a scale of big head to little head. Let's relabel it, okay? Status quo team and innovative team. Every team is gonna have a full gamut of individuals, but as in the innovation leader, I need to have specific strategy and policies and leadership to do the right things to make it more innovative. First of all, I can attract <coughs> big heads. That's the reason I'm here, right? You guys are smart people. We try to attract the smart, the brightest people to join our team, the people that will be big heads. Number two, I coach people. You're gonna come to apply, you're gonna be coached. You're gonna come maybe a little timid, say I'm afraid to fail. And tell you, you know what? To try new things, experimentations mean sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. We'll coach you. We'll make sure you understand that to be to move very fast, you can't have 100% guarantees. You need to move very fast, you need to have comfort in succeeding and sometimes failing, okay? Worst you can do is lose these hard to manage people and replace them with easy, easy to manage folks. You move the gas and distribution to the left, you start innovating, it's a very structured, very stable environment, everyone listens to their boss, and we all go to, gone together in the ship underwater. Okay? The other elements we look to people we attract, because I'm gonna give you the, what are we looking for when we attract these individuals to our team? People to follow through. We move very, very fast. We can't check on everyone. How are you doing it? How are you executing to your plan? You know, are you falling in what you committed to? So we're looking for people we call high say do ratio. There's a follow through on their commitment. Okay? We cannot afford to have people who have to check on them all the time. Next is collaboration. Innovation is not a single person sport, it's a team sport. We need people that can work as a team. They communicate, they listen, they're able to work across you know, the cube, but also across the ocean. Part of my team is in India. I'm looking for people in Santa Clara that can work with a group in India or a group in Montana. So that cross-cultural communication and collaboration is absolutely critical for moving very fast and innovating. Okay, so you can see it's like a three axis that I'm trying to drive. And we actually go and interview individuals to our team looking at all three axes. We need to make sure the people are big heads. Now you know what big head is, right? We're looking at people, high say, do ratio. Now, I can tell you, this is more personality and characteristic like. That's why we look in terms of personality and attitudes. And we look a lot of personality and attitudes when we look to attract people to our team. And to do that, we need direct leadership, right? And with that, I'll just summarize what are the key elements of the leadership that we find very effective for our environment. We call it the innovation leadership, okay? First up, we need people that are leading from the side. They don't feel like they're the figurehead for everything done in their team. We need people that inspire. Remember that chaos we talked about earlier? If I can't control everything, I need to inspire people to go in a certain direction that they believe it's the right way to go. And they need to choose their own path going in that general direction, in that vision, okay? Need people that trust and delegates, not goes and controls everything in their team. Notice that's very complementary to the big head. If you're a leader like that, you'll be comfortable with the big heads. You find new approaches. You don't do always things in the same way. You harness the ability of others. You don't think, I can do everything. People are just going to listen to me and obey me. Has a very clear vision and are able to communicate it. Big heads do want to have freedom 
want to try new things, but fundamentally want to know why we're going where we're going, why it's important, need a very clear vision, and able to communicate that. Need to prioritize both strategic and static tactical. If you invest all your time doing the incremental innovation, you don't invest in next technology exploration, when that is required, it's not going to be there. So the ability to bounce in the strategic and, in, and the tactical is very, very critical. They ask questions. They don't always give the answers. Okay? They tr it treats staff as colleagues, not <coughs> you know, as subordinates, solicit inputs rather than, you know, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. And you can s see that every point we make a decision as a company, an in innovative company, I solicit the input of the team. Okay? There's always type of decision making that works more effective in that kind of team, called consultative. We try to get the inputs of the staff. You still own the decision most of the time, but you need to, to draw on the best of your team. You build a team that can create and innovate. You empower people. You don't instruct them on everything they do. Okay? <coughs> Hire is based on attitude. Remember earlier about the three axes we talked about the attitude? This is more important to me. I expect academic rigor. I expect depth of knowledge in the area you are hired for. But the attitude, the right approach, the creativity, the talent is as important to me as the depth. Encourage and <coughs> construct, uh, you know, constructive engagement. Cares about ideas and people. I'm going to go, you can read it yourself. You know, comfortable taking risks, not avoids risk. So these are the characteristics. And we look at managers, directors of my team, leaders. This is what we model. You notice there are two approaches. One is very much command and control. The one on the left, very much command and control. The one on the right is feeling that comfortable in that balance between chaos and order. Okay, so I'm going to summarize these skills for these innovation leaders. First of all, for its very, very clear vision, brings the team, this is where we're going to go. These are the high value problem we're going to try to solve. And that's the reason we're doing it. Attract big heads and comfortable managing them. Okay, finds balance between efficient tactics and execution. Okay, becomes effective coach. 80-20 means you spend 80% 80 of your time coaching these people. They're going to drive the innovation for the future. Drives rapid learning. Remember we talked earlier, money into knowledge. Assures learning is enabled by robust networking. So I'm going to try to bring it all together before we're going to close and ask open to questions. I'm going to give you an example. I read the book. I think it's a great book. If you've not read it, I recommend everyone to read Steve book, Steve Jobs' book. But for me, the takeaway is very simple. Okay, he was clearly an innovative leader. But if you look what's written there on the left, the bottom, he was not necessarily the most technical person in his team. His ability to contribute to solving the touchscreen problem, the battery problem, the antenna problems, or even the aesthetic of the product, he was not able to create it, but he was able to create a very clear vision where the product is going to go. Okay? So his team needed his absolute vision, his passion, his drive to create this great product you're used to. Okay? But his team, without his vision, probably would not have created what you know. Okay? So Steve, with his team, so able to bring great products, okay, one after another. Each one of them revolutionizing. He was not the technical, but he was a very clear visionary. He knew to bring the teams, and people think he was an autocrat, and I'll prove you wrong in a minute. Okay. I'll give you three examples that shows that actually Steve knew that sometimes he was absolutely wrong and knows to be corrected. First example, iTunes. Do you know that Steve Jobs actually believed iTunes should be released only for the Macs, not for the PCs? Even though most of the people were using PCs at the time. 
he was passionate that this is, should be a product for the Mac only. Was that limiting the iPod market? Yes. Yeah. By a lot. Okay. Next, the first commitment to do the iPhone was based on an Atom processor from Intel. There was a handshake there. We're going to make this phone based on an Atom processor. His team passionately disagreed with him. Remember they we talked earlier about the passion? Passionately disagree with him that this will be the failing of that phone. Okay? Last example that probably you're going to laugh when you hear it. He, def he thought initially that Apple should be the only one publishing uh, apps for his phone. Okay? You should not be able to get a Facebook app and a you know, Yelp app and whatever Google app. He thought only Apple should be able to release apps for his products. Imagine. He was wrong in all three accounts. And guess what? He listened to his team. Why I'm telling you the story? He had the big heads in his team. He listened to them. And even though he already made decision, he knew to correct himself and go in the right direction, but listen to his team. And a good innovation leader, really able to do that. To have a very clear vision, but able to also assemble great teams to correct them when they're going the wrong direction. Okay? Uh, so the last slide, just give you a sense of what we're trying to look for when we hire people. We often say we're looking for T-shaped individual, not physically, but T-shaped individual. We're looking at people that are going extremely deep in the field that they're hired for, and they're very broad and know a lot, but very little about it in a very broad area. So okay, in a very broad area, so very interdisciplinary. They can touch many areas, but in their field, if it's a software engineer, mechanical engineer, marketing, they go very, very deep. Okay, so left, I'm showing just example of technical areas that we're always looking for, but on the right side, I'm talking about the general skills, the one we talk about, the attitude, the <coughs> personalities. We're looking for people that. Are System thinker, to communicate well. Ethic, ethics are very critical to us. Okay? They collaborate. They're comfortable in a multicultural, fast-moving environment. They want to innovate. They have a passion to do so. Okay, that's, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you.